Can Astra break a water rocket world record? Well, after doing some math, I think yes. While we've been in the middle of building and testing the Transcendence vehicle, which of course we want to break the record for being the highest rocket ever launched by a student group, we thought it'd be interesting to take on a fun summer project where we try to break a world record in the world of water rockets. Water rockets are maybe some of the simplest forms of propulsion that you can use as an amateur because basically they're just using water as the propulsive element for the vehicle. And oftentimes you can make these rockets with just things that are lying around your house. So an easy build for a first time rocketeer. But the real question is, how difficult is it really to break one of those records? Over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be designing, building, and hopefully flying a water rocket, which we hope will actually break one of these water rocket world records. But before we go into those steps, we first need to understand what the water rocket records are today, and also a little bit about how water rockets work in principle. All of these factors will inform our design and allow us to have a compliant vehicle while also hopefully exploiting some rules of physics to help us get those extra couple meters that'll hopefully allow us to break a record. I can't change the laws of physics. So it turns out there's a bit of an authority with respect to water rockets with a group called the Water Rocket Achievement World Record Association. They even have a website which you can go to, which will be linked in the description below. Essentially, there are five different categories which you can qualify for in order to achieve a world record. The first three classes are specifically referring to water rockets which can use any sort of materials in their construction, which kind of makes them a bit more difficult to attain because uh, obviously people have already resorted to using things like carbon fiber and aluminum and fancy materials that are giving you lots of strength and not so much weight. But this is not really in the realm of uh, easy feasibility for a general audience, I would say. So we're actually not gonna attempt these world records because we already have all of our efforts with those types of materials working on transcendence. Instead, we're gonna focus on the last two categories, which are class D and class E. And these two classes use unreinforced water bottles in order to achieve their highest altitudes. This is important because the bare plastic bottles can only take so much pressure. Of course, if you reinforce them with all kinds of fancy materials, you can get those pressures going really, really high. And water rocket power is basically a function of how much pressure you put into the rocket that you're firing. So there are a couple of rules which you have to follow in order to be compliant with uh, the different classes of a rocket records. So for a class D, you need to, of course, use water as your reaction mass. Um, you have to have a dry mass of your vehicle, which is under 1.5 kilograms. This means that you basically weigh the vehicle without the water in it, and it has to be less than that. Um, I'd be surprised if you may have built one that was more than 1.5 kilograms because that would be a pretty heavy rocket. <laughs> there are also some rules around the bottle that you're allowed to use. So you can't actually use a bottle which exceeds two liters. The next rule is having to do with the pressure. Um, so the maximum pressure that you're allowed to use in that bottle is 6.9 bar, which is 100 PSI. And uh, you have to show that you're only pressurizing it to that much in order to be compliant for the record. The next item has to do with how you manufacture the rocket. So you can't uh, have a pre-made rocket, you have to build it from scratch yourself, of course. The next rule has to do with how you record your altitude. So of course you need to have some sort of altitude measuring device which will record how high your bottle has gone and that has to be contained on the bottle itself. Then next up you actually have to have a video recording device on your rocket. So you also need to have a camera probably somewhere on the bottle rocket which records the flight itself. And you also need to have a ground-based camera that records the flight as well. And that's just to make sure that the flight actually took place. Then finally, you need to actually perform this launch two times. So you don't, you don't just launch the rocket once, you have to actually launch it twice within a two hour period. So basically you average out the height of the two flights and then that is the number that gets listed as the record that you have. Those are all the rules for the class D category. The record for this category is actually held by a guy called Kevin Colville and he flew his bottle rocket up to an altitude of 127.1 meters. Which when you think about it is like pretty high, like that's more than a football field. Overall, I think this record would be a pretty tough one to beat. So if we are gonna go for it, it's definitely gonna be a bit challenging in terms of the physics involved. But there's actually one other record that might be interesting, which is the class E category. And this is basically the open design for the unreinforced bottle. So you're not as limited in terms of the design choices that you can make with the bottle. You don't have to just stick to one bottle. You can actually use many bottles and kind of stitch them together, or you can you know, try something else. You could do a multi-stage design. So there's kind of a lot more freedom in terms of what you're allowed to do. The other interesting difference with the class E category is actually that you don't have a pressure limitation in how much pressure you can put into the bottle. So with the class D design, you can only put in 100 PSI or 6.9 bar. 
but in the class E you can put as much as your bottle can handle, but still you can't reinforce it. So um, you're still going to be limited by basically plastics uh, ability to contain pressure. So what is the record for the class E category? Well, actually there is no record for the class E category. There's yet to be a qualifier who met all the requirements in order to generate a mark for this specific flight. Oh my God! Wow! But to make this a bit challenging for us, we won't consider this to be a success unless we've actually beaten the class D category record, because it would be kind of silly if the open concept can't beat the class D stringent requirements. So after all this consideration, let's see if we can actually physics our way to a world record. But before we can do that, we have to delve a little bit into the physics of how a water rocket works. And then hopefully we can exploit them in order to generate a record breaking performance. So basically water rockets work based on the Newtonian principle of for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So to get that equal and opposite reaction, we actually end up pushing water through the nozzle and that will push the bottle forward. And the way that we push that water out the nozzle is by compressing air inside of the bottle and that compressed air pushes the water out of the nozzle and generates our thrust. So in principle, the more pressure you have in your bottle, the more push you get on the water and the more thrust you'll have for a given mass of water that you have in your bottle. So if we want to make a record breaking bottle rocket, we need to basically get our pressure as high as we can. The next thing that's important is to think about how much water we actually want to put into the bottle. So the more water we have in there, the more reaction mass we have, and potentially the more thrust we can get in the long run of the full thrusting phase of the, of the bottle rocket. But the more water we have in the rocket, the less air we have, which means that we have less uh, pushing force on the water the later we go into the thrust phase, and we actually end up potentially getting less thrust. So there's actually a happy medium that happens where there is a perfect amount of ratio between water and air in the bottle, and we basically can get the most out of our rocket that's possible. A key to trying to design a world record breaking rocket is to try to maximize that uh, relationship and get the most out of the physics that we can in that system. The next part of water rocket design, which is actually really important, is the aerodynamics. So actually most of the energy of the vehicle actually ends up probably going into drag. So we want to really minimize the drag that the water rocket has. So if we want to figure out how high our bottle rocket's going to go, we kind of need to consider the different forces that are acting on the rocket. So at the start of the rocket's thrust, we basically have one force, which is going to be pushing it upwards. And that's the thrust that we have from the water. And we can model what that thrust will look like using this fancy equation. Basically, there's a bunch of physics in that equation having to do with like the Bernoulli principle and choked flow and all that kind of stuff. We can use this formula to figure out what the thrust phase will look like in terms of the power and the length. And that's just based on how much pressure we have in the vessel, how much water we put in there, and also what the diameter of our nozzle is. So using all that math, we can really figure out what the force on the water rocket will be pushing it upwards. But we also need to think about the things that are pulling it back down. So of course, gravity will always be acting to pull the rocket back down at a acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared. But also we'll have drag acting on the water rocket, seeking to slow it down as it shoots up into the air. And we can model that drag based on the following formula. This is just the basic drag formula that takes into account the surface area of the part, the velocity that the part is traveling at, the density of the air, and also the coefficient of drag that the shape of the vehicle has. Our goal will be to make the coefficient of drag as small as possible because this is purely determined by the shape and we can kind of influence that by designing our nose cone appropriately. So now that we have an idea of how a water rocket actually works in terms of the physics of the flight that's happening, we can actually put all of this into an Excel sheet, which will basically calculate for us what the maximum trajectory can be. Two hours later. Okay, so what we've done here is basically we have created this uh, fancy little sheet here, which is going to be describing the physics that's happening with our uh, water rocket launch. We have a bunch of columns here, uh, which are describing each of the pieces of the bottle rocket with respect to the, the gas that's in the bottle and the water, and then determining from based on the pressures and the size of the bottle and stuff, what the exhaust speeds will be. And then from there, figuring out what the thrust will be. And then I've also incorporated some things with respect to the drag on the vehicle. And from there, you can kind of go and start calculating out like things like your acceleration, your position and your velocity. It's pretty comprehensive, this, sh this sheet, with respect to trying to figure out what exactly your final altitude will be for a water rocket launch. 
The only thing you have to do on this sheet is basically put in the variables that you want into the yellow boxes here. So those things are basically the pressure that you're going to pressurize the water rocket to, the length that the bottle has, the radius that the bottle has, um, the throat diameter, or sorry, the throat radius that you want, and finally the dry mass of the vehicle. So uh, this is kind of making a small assumption, which is basically that the bottle is a perfect cylinder. Of course, bottles aren't perfect cylinders, but uh, for the purpose of this analysis, it's a good enough approximation. Let's see what happens if we plug in some numbers for like a standard sized bottle, let's say. So the maximum pressure we can go to is 6.9 bar. So that is uh, 690,000 kilopascals. And for the length of a standard soda bottle, the ones that are two liters, usually those are about uh, 30 centimeters tall or so. So we're just gonna put in 0 0.3. For the radius, usually the radius of a two liter bottle is somewhere in the range of uh, four to five centimeters. So we're just gonna put in um, 0 0.047, let's say. I think that gives us about two liters. Yeah, that's giving us about two liters in the end. And for the diameter of the throat, uh, sorry, the radius of the throat, that's just basically how big the opening is that you're gonna make, that where the water's gonna come out of. Okay, uh, usually something on the order of one centimeter is typical, so we'll just put one centimeter. And for the dry mass, how much mass the bottle will have when it's completely dry, I'm expecting that you can probably get in the range of like 300 grams or so. So let's just put in 300. And let's see what we get. So basically after putting all those pieces in, you just have to look to the green box here, which is showing you the max height. And it's only 57 meters, so <laughs> yeah, that's a bit less than than it should be. <laughs> uh, the record is 127 meters, so 57 is definitely slightly shy of that, I would say. Come on now, doll. What what is going on here, and what are the parameters that we can affect? Right now, we're kind of using a flat assumption for drag, which is that the coefficient of drag will be 0 0.3. So maybe if we play around with that a little bit we can maybe get a little bit higher. So basically what that means is that we're gonna to try to reduce the drag on the on the ball rocket uh, as much as we can. Um, so yeah, I'll just throw in another parameter here. So here you can see that, okay, if we have zero drag, like we could get up to an altitude of 73 meters. So even if we like perfected this vehicle and made it so that it had no drag, we still can't beat the record of 127 meters. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? Clearly we need to try something else in order to get ourselves up to a higher altitude. The other parameter that you kind of have that you're able to play with is the dry mass. So obviously the less your dry mass is, the higher it'll go in the end. So maybe if we reduce that a little bit, so like 300 grams is where it is at now, let's move it to like like 200 grams. Okay, like it was 71 meters. Okay, how about 100 grams? <laughs> now that, that's like a super light bottle. I don't know if that's even possible. 75 meters, that doesn't give you much. <laughs> Maybe if we decrease the drag coefficient as well. My goodness, let's move it down to like 0 0.2 maybe. Oh man, only 93 meters. Well, uh, yeah, that's, uh, this is a tricky one. <laughs> How the heck is this not working? If I move it to zero, zero drag, what does it come out to be? 240 meters. Okay, so you can, maybe if you decrease the drag to like 0 0.1. Ah, there you go. Now you can beat the record. 128. <laughs> it only takes like an impossible vehicle. So you have to get your dry mass below 100 grams and your drag coefficient below 0 0.1. Um, that does make no sense. My man. So using the standard 2 liter pop bottle, um, it looks like the record is already quite well um, optimized to the point where basically you have to really nearly break the laws of physics to make it work. But if we maybe can think about what could make this better, we can maybe get some more altitude with a more of an open design. If you make the bottle longer, basically you can uh, keep the drag roughly the same uh, because the the, the area coefficient of the part that's going to the windstream is the same area, right? If you keep the diameter the same. But if you make the length longer, uh, you, got, you kind of get that extra mass 
kind of for free in terms of the drag coefficient. So maybe we just make this a bit longer. Maybe that's the solution. So maybe make it like 0 0.5 or something. So then, yeah, then we can get up to 143 meters. Uh, maybe we can make this even longer. So maybe if we put like three bottles together, three bottles together, so let's say like 0 0.8 or something. And maybe if we don't use such a wide bottle, I mean, we kind of like make the bottle a bit uh, skinnier. So maybe like 0 0.04 or something. Uh, then we're getting up to 170 meters. All right. A great success. A drag coefficient is still 0 0.1. Maybe we change that to 0 0.2, make it a little more realistic. That's still giving us 139. That's still more than the 127. So this is in the right direction. The other thing we can kind of play around with at the open category is the pressure. So uh, with class D, you're restricted to 6.9 bar, but with class E, you can kind of push that pressure as high as you want uh, for the for the open concept. So maybe we can figure out a way to get the pressure in the bottle up to around 10 bar. Then we're getting some nice height. So 188 meters, there we go. The pressure is really the ultimate decider here. If you can push that pressure up, usually it's quite effective. So maybe we're kind of coming close to a design here. So maybe we can go to something like 100, or sorry, to 10 bar with a length of 0 0.8 meters, which is actually pretty long. You're probably gonna have to put like three or four bottles together to make that work. Uh, a bottle which has a diameter of about uh, eight centimeters or a radius of four centimeters. That should be possible. Most water bottles are in that range. Uh, we need a throat that has a radius of 0 0.005. So a five, a, a 0 0.5 centimeter radius throat. So one centimeter diameter. And we want to have a dry mass of less than 200 grams. That's going to be tricky. I don't think that's going to be possible. If we have such a long thing, let's, let's make that 0 0.3 grams or something. Yeah, 0 0.3 kilograms. So 300 grams, maybe that's possible. And then we get a drag coefficient down to 0 0.2 somehow. And if we do all that, we should have a launch altitude of 163 meters. I would count that as successful. Yeah, and then we can set that record. So it is possible if you push the laws of physics a little bit. Join us next time to see us try to build this rocket. And remember to expand your horizons.